So my name is Julie Wildman, and I was the 2020, 2021, 2020, 2021, <laughs> um, intrepid credit union fellowship recipient. This is the first time that intrepid credit union has done a fellowship with the culture, I believe. So I was really excited to be one of the. Um, first recipient for this year-long project. Um, so this is my exhibit, Body in Motion, and so this is just a background while I talk about my proposal. Um, so the call for the Intrepid Fellowship went out at the beginning of 2020, and I was looking at it during the spring, and the I put the application in in the summer, and I don't know if you remember, but that was a little bit of a weird time. Um, we started to get really hunkered down with the coronavirus, lockdowns, it was very uncertain. So as a person who has a lot of background and experience in movement and performance, there was this huge question mark of how do you propose an art exhibit that usually requires that people be together <laughs> to experience it if you can't be together? And there was this whole um, new anxiety about bodies and how they can be you know, like vessels for disease and contagion, and like we even started getting a little bit alienated from our own bodies, like you can't touch your face and you have to like wash your hands. So there was a really, um, it felt very pressing to me to do something with movement and do something with bodies, especially at a time where the bodies were feeling so uncertain and so weird. So my original proposal had to do a lot with anatomy and physiology. Um, a lot of that background comes from my experience as a dancer and as somebody who um, tries very hard to recover from injury, somebody who tries to research into the most effective and easy ways to use my body so I can use it for a long amount of time. And I was really lucky to go to a couple of, of workshops, um, some dance workshops, some body work workshops, um, that started to introduce different ways of thinking about the body for me. So my original proposal had to do with thinking about the relationship of the pelvis to the jaw and the eyes and the ears and the vestibular system, um, which is our balance system. And as I dove a little deeper into the research, it really started to become very entwined with evolutionary biology and a lot of the, um, the different anatomical features that unite different clades of animals. <laughs> so this is my research slide. I kind of, I was thinking about how to approach talking about research because it's a lot of the classical way that you think of research through books and, and written material and online essays and, and talking to people, but there's also a lot of um, movement and creative research that's a part of my project. Um, workshops, community workshops, and engaging people in my research and in movement was a very important part of developing this process. Um, and I really went through a lot of experimentation with different media to figure out like how to how best to um, wrap my head around everything. So some of the some of the books, just a quick shout out to some of the books that uh, I found really helpful were The Body, um, which is by Bill Bryson. There's Anatomy is a Cultural History, um, whose author is escaping me. Um, Richard Dawkins is a really fantastic but uh, kind of heady writer. Uh, Carl Zimmer, wonderful science writer, uh, and Julie Burwald, uh, who wrote Spineless, was very influential um, in this process. Uh, and then there were workshops. So the, the, the point of doing workshops for me was to start to share the research that I found interesting with a group of people, see what was captivating to them as well, and also figure out what parts I was conveying effectively and what parts there are still a lot of, there 
there's still gaps in. Um, one thing that I've realized with a very research-based practice is that you start to develop blind spots, a lot of blind spots. Like you, you read the same word enough in enough journals and you assume that it's common knowledge when it, it really shouldn't be assumed that it is. Um, so my workshops, generally I would introduce some of the research material that I was working on and then invite participants to move with me and explore in different ways. Will you play the thing? So I had the article about the fish and the rays and whatnot, and gills came up. And so I just kind of kept thinking of this open and closed movement. I was just a reminder of like how in different parts of the body I can be not only used to think about my animals being, and also having just moved to the, I just moved to the ranch. And um, I spend a lot of time with sheep and horses and cattle. And so I feel like you're gonna take this back and I feel like that in a different way. Or like, you know, how do they see their life and how do they see their life? What are they hearing versus not hearing? And so yeah, it actually giving you a really valuable content. I think I would start being literal here, like ear to the ground, listening for sound. And then I was thinking about the human ear and how there's three parts to it. And then going over to the animal side of things, how we only have that one, um, we don't have an outer or middle ear, but we can still feel sound. Caitlin said, it always throws me off when I move into a new place because I haven't gotten used to where the sound comes from. Mm -hmm. Using the mom will give you the understanding of vibration and then going that direction and just gaining a sense of space within that way. And then having the disturbance and not being able to respond to vibration. Light penetrates, is absorbed, and then is reflected back in. So you can always coming back into light, absorbed, light, or light penetrates, light's absorbed, and then reflected back into light. Mine was, I was trying to use the technique of the plant of like some of me moving towards gravity and some of me moving away. Um, um, while revisiting the sequence from the initial drawings that we did. I never knew a shrimp had probably the coolest eye on the planet. <laughs> you know, and just instead of taking these other beings for granted in their experience in the world in a whole other way, it's really honor that and to think what it is to be there. But that was, it was really fun to work with everybody and kind of engage them with these research questions that I had. Um, there are some, some movements that got thrown out in that first workshop that ended up making it into the movie and kind of directing a, a, a research question. Like the, there's an entire scene with the crocodile that came from a question that happened in this first workshop. This is from the second workshop series um, where I was starting to think a little bit more about the structure of the story and the structure of the exhibit. And I did some workshops that were based in the scenes um, and the plots that had been developed. So here I had different participants looking through um, simulations of different visual apparatus. It comes from a scene in the story where there's a mantis strip painting instructor who's attempting to give instructions about painting and not able to convey all of the different light spectrum that she's seeing um, and getting super frustrated with her, uh, with her pupils. <laughs> um, so these are all different 
um, paintings that were developed by participants over the course of the workshop. And it was really awesome for me to be able to see the different interpretations of the props and the different, different ways that people would in, uh, synthesize that visual information. Um, so in addition to just the, the reading research and the workshop research, I did a lot of research through rehearsals. These are two video clips of rehearsal material that I did not end up using. Um, this first one on the left is a status skirt, which is a little bit difficult to, it, it's a weighted skirt, and I was like, oh, that's a really cool way to um, portray gravity. What about putting a bunch of weight in a skirt and trying to dance with that? And the answer is that it doesn't look as cool as it feels exhausting. <laughs> is from a rehearsal that I did with Amber Moon Peterson and Nina Mercy. They were really my main core of dancers. They were there for a lot of the initial research um, that went into rehearsals. So asking them to experiment with their bodies and experiment movement, I, I think I gave them a lot less context than I gave the workshop participants. So they were absolutely game with me just saying like, um, we're going to do this kind of movement without without any context whatsoever. But this is a clip from from a rehearsal that we ended up not using it really. We worked on that piece for like two months, and I kept on like changing it, and then we ended up totally scrapping it. It was one of those situations where you put the most amount of work into making something work and then it, it just, you need to let it be. Um, so we also, I also did a bunch of multimedia research. Um, I, was, I knew that this exhibit was going to be a multimedia installation. I didn't know exactly what that meant. I think I probably drove the holder just like a tiny little bit nuts when we had our quarterly check-ins and I would give them all these ideas and all this research and show them snippets of rehearsals and, and what we've been doing in the workshops and then they'd say, that sounds awesome, what's it going to look like? <laughs> and I was like, I'll tell you in October when it goes up. Um, and I think I got a little bit closer probably in September, which is still Pretty, pretty close, but I ended up working a lot with digital art um, to kind of experiment through different perceptual apparatus. Um, I did a lot of, of visual and like tactile moving of pieces and making of things. Um, this center one, we don't have to watch because it's just a, a demonstration of the very cursory research that I was doing with video editing and like thank goodness um, Lenny Eckert did my video and just made the vision of all of this like amazing beyond belief. He really did um, a great job. I so if, if Lenny hadn't done the video, the whole the whole uh, dance film would have been like that when we have studio in the background. <laughs> just one overlay. Um, and 
I was trying to figure out a lot of like how I wanted to portray their bodies and how their bodies are similar to our own. Um, so the process of making these ended up being paper, handmade paper and fabric. I love how fast it looks. Oh, I'm not really this. I'm not really that. This is an eight weeks later. <laughs> I like the costume changes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I thought about that on like day three of the time lapse. And I was like, maybe I should have been wearing the same thing. You <laughs> tell what the weather is too. So puppets actually ended up being a, like a very important part of this process, which was interesting and very surprising to me. I don't have a lot of experience as a puppeteer. Um, so the fact that they became such an important part of the, the film and then the exhibit was super interesting. Um, so part of, the, part of the experimentation with multimedia was trying to figure out how to make the whole world and the whole exhibit and, and something that could fill this amazing space. Um, and I knew I wanted it to be an exhibit through which you could move. I mean, the whole proposal was about movement and bodies, and so it felt really kind of antithetical to that to just make a film where people would sit and watch it and then and leave. So I had a lot of design ideas where I, I wanted people to be able to navigate the space. I didn't want it to be like an escape room level difficult, but <laughs> I wanted it to be like an, uh, like a participatory experience that you can actually feel like you're immersed in. So a lot of a lot of time went to trying to figure out how how to do that. I, I had some um, media experimentation. Um, I thought about creating like a tactile stage for a while, which is, uh, they, they have speakers called transducers, and they take audio information and make it feelable. So that was an idea for a while. Um, there are some amazing programs to do projection mapping, which is instead of putting like a projection of an image on a two-dimensional surface, you can, you can wrap it around three-dimensional surfaces and make it really seamless. Uh, there's a lot of media that gives you the option for interactive projection, um, which is all super exciting. Um, a lot of it ended up being like, um, I, I would like research to the precipice of this like, very, very big dive. Um, so these are some of the, the ways that I was trying to think about the exhibit. And then I also wanted to include some of the the different ideas that didn't end up making it into the story. There's a lot of like very whimsical um, plot points, but my the last one to go was the dinner party where a time lapse of animals devour a whale carcass. 
that's rotting at the bottom of the sea, and there is a, an overlay of etiquette, like fine dining etiquette, like, oh, this was the side of it. Um, it was a nature documentary. Um, for a long time, I was thinking about if narrative was going to be a part of the dance film, and I thought, what better way to integrate animals than do it in a nature documentary style? Um, another one that I couldn't quite figure out how to do was the Mac Quest one, where a person is on the phone with their friend and trying to get directions, but their friend is giving them directions in three-dimensional space because they live underwater and the person lives on land and they're getting super confused. So there were a lot of ideas that like got its name for various reasons. A lot of them had to do with feasibility. Like filming underwater was also an idea that got cut. <laughs> Well, the sip and dip was renovating. So, <laughs> also, it would have been really, really difficult. Um, but then, through all of those ideas, as I was like going through story points and plots and figuring out how to take this research and make it interesting, um, I came to this character, Mika. Um, I feel like the whole process of discovering and developing characters throughout this exhibit has been like excavation. Um, like you see, you see like a little bit of an artifact, and then you start like very carefully sweeping away things, and, and it emerges. So it feels like in a lot of ways these things kind of emerge more than than I actively create them. Um, and Miko is a, a really surprising person to kind of pop out in this creative process. It, she ended up being the, not the narrator as in giving, like speaking, but she ended up being the guide through the story, which is, you know, such a staple literary trope. Like, you have a guide to go through the inferno, um, or Paradise Lost, which is also an inferno. <laughs> Lots of infernos. Or, or even in the, in the tradition of like, um, literary nonsense with Alice in Wonderland or um, The Point. There are these characters who are kind of your guide to go through a story. So she kind of became that person. And I was also thinking throughout this whole process, like how do I, how do I present something that's interesting to me in a way that is interesting to other people and captivating. And the, and the answer really was through story and through character. And I knew that, but then I still had this question of like, but why why would I be interested in the story besides the fact that it's hilarious? Like some of these ideas are hilarious. Um, and the answer really had to do with me as a young person um, being really interested in the world around me. There, I was really lucky to grow up um, partially in a place with a lot of outdoor space. There was a like this bridge that I spent a lot of time on, um, just over this stream, and I could spend hours. I think it was hours. I don't know. My sense of time is not that great as a young child, nor as a person captivated by the things in front of me. Um, but you can really dive into a whole universe in like 10 square feet as a kid. So Mika also became like a me portal in a lot of ways. And I realized like, oh, this proposal that I gave to the Holter was something that was interesting intellectually for sure. And like interesting emotionally, but there's also like a very, uh, there's a very like raw childhood interest for me that was able to really come through this character, um, which was, I I think <laughs> they joke that like I, I kind of dressed Mika like a like a me like a little me. <laughs> um, and then these are just I wanted to share some of the other character developments um, that I went through. So these generally go from right to to left with some of the earlier sketches, um, and then the kind of the final look. 
This is Linda, the fitness Sifaka. So she's a lemur who leads a, an exercise class for tetrapods. This is Ron, the crocodile. Ron was formerly named Lyle because it rhymed, but um, <laughs> then Lyle the crocodile turns out to be an adorable like children's book. Mm -hmm. I was like, mm, it's not that cute. <laughs> Um, so these were, there was my look for when I was still trying to figure her out. Here's Medusa, the jellyfish. She went through a lot of different um, phases. Draco, the mantis strip art instructor. These are the imps, humans models. They're kind of the human animals that you meet at the end the exhibition film. Um, and these are the medians, which are the bilaterally sem uh, symmetrical beings. So throughout this development, um, it was really interesting and challenging to try to work on figuring out these characters during rehearsal, and then also work on how to create a dance for film. When you're doing a dance just on a stage, there's a lot of very easy decisions that are made for you. Like your audience is going to be generally where they're expected to be and um, that you'll face that way or you'll make a decision to face a different way. You can make decisions about how you're going to space your bodies based on how it will look to a certain vantage point. Um, but film presents a lot of different options. I knew that I didn't want necessarily just a static angle because I got let to do it for me and I didn't need to just use a static <laughs> angle. Um, and I also knew that I didn't want all of the performances to be on stage or in an inside space. So there became a lot of different things to play with, like where do you film and how do you rehearse? Um, if you're going to be filming on a beach or in a warehouse. Um, Forward or video? Video. And I'll just talk. So this is uh, at Richard Swanson's studio. Um, and it might look visually comparable to like a dance floor, but it's actually a very uneven, rough surface with nails sticking out of it. I mean the head part of the nail, not the pokey part of the nail. Um, we did a lot of tree dancing. Um, so needing to do specific choreography for being in a tree and also practicing it um, on that site. This is for our crocodiles at the beach. The beach is a little bit out of town, so we also did some rehearsals in the volleyball pit. <laughs> this is a really wonderful one that I'll, I'll explain a little bit later, but um, this is when I made Taya dance backwards, like a, a bunch of backwards dancing, so she's jumping into the painting, so narratively she's jumping back. This is our jellyfish who is actually performing the choreography twice as fast so that the video can be slowed down and give it kind of an underwater feeling. This is how we dropped Mika oh. into the water! <laughs> I'm so glad to see that because I've been wondering. I know, yeah. There was a really amazing, there was a really amazing one where it was like a Mission Impossible type of thing where she got dropped like one inch, like her nose like right near the water. She's like, ah! And like hung out there for a while and nobody was filming. I was like, oh, about that. Um, yeah, so, so there were a lot of like tricky things about figuring out a dance for film, but there's also, like I mentioned, so. The imps who are at the end of the dance film are actually all filmed in reverse. And I really wanted to give kind of a, um, like, not quite grotesque, but a little bit, like, surreal feel to these human creatures. 
features. So they're very familiar in a lot of ways. They're, they're, they're anatomically, they're human, and like animalistically, they're human. But I really wanted to get to that human animal type of, type of feel. So we ended up doing the whole scene in reverse, um, which is like really amazing that you can you have the technology to do that. But it also meant that for some of those transitions, we needed to be really deliberate about rehearsing. Like you think, oh, if you're walking forward and you're gonna film it in reverse, you just walk backwards. But the mechanics of walking backwards are completely different than the mechanics of walking forward. So we probably spent like three hours just figuring out how to walk forwards to look like you're walking backwards and vice versa. Oh, right it. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so using film as a storytelling media was also a very interesting challenge. On the very far left over there is my attempts at storyboards. So thinking about, there are some very surreal transitions, um, and how do you present a transition in the media of film in a, in a way that makes sense? I think that the transitions ended up taking up the most amount of, of effort to, to we ended up lugging the door down to um, like the beach at Canyon Ferry down by the Shannon boat launch because there needs to be like a narrative impetus for you to be from one place to another place. And even if those places are completely surreal, um, it's like how do you get from a beach to a dance studio to a warehouse? You can't just go there. There has to be a door. Like <laughs> there has to be a door. So figuring out how to do all of those transitions became super important. And we also ended up using puppets, like I mentioned. Um, one, of, one of the things that became clear to me in retrospect about my style is that I don't, I don't really gravitate towards literal representations of the animal. Like, I, I, there are a lot of, like, call-outs to their different anatomies and the ways that they look, but I'm not really into, like, put on a doll costume to be a doll. <laughs> like, unless it's Halloween, then go for it. So we have this question of, like, how do, you, how do you convey to an audience that you're looking at a mantis shrimp if you just see, like, this person in this mantis shrimp costume that doesn't actually look like a literal mantis shrimp? So that's where we started to use puppets quite a bit. Um, and then I think the, the last step and the last thing I'll talk about is, is incorporating the story through the installation and, and also presenting the written story. Um, it, it's always been important, I think, through this project to to give people a sense of wonder and whimsy and make available the scientific research and background that I find really fascinating without feeling like you need to know it in order to like get it and, and without feeling like you need to come in with some kind of special knowledge. Um, so the, the idea of breaking up this this exhibit into kind of smaller chunks um, and then giving narrative options, giving giving a story that's written that you can you can read the narrative if you would like, you can read the scientific research if you would like, but you don't have to. Like you can appreciate it at at different levels. And I don't I don't feel like it's necessary to um, to make people like understand evolution. So it's not really the point, the point of it really more is wonder. Um, yeah, so those are just like an assortment of, of my thoughts of making this exhibit. I really appreciate all of you coming out again. Um, big thank you to the Holter for like giving me the space and the opportunity and really giving me the go ahead for a lot of different <laughs> ideas. Um, big thank you to Intrepid Credit Union for funding this fellowship. It's a really amazing opportunity to have for our arts community, and I, I hope that they continue to, to support local artists like this. Um, 
Huge thanks to Lenny Eckert and Dead Dino Productions and Ember Moon, who helped me create like everything. Um, BJ helped me like fabricate all of the stuff. <laughs> so many hours of volunteer labor. Um, thanks to all of the dancers and all of the space that I was able to share. This is really one of those things that, like, after I put up the exhibit and there was the opening night, I felt like really bizarre, like, seeing my name in vinyl because there's such a community, like, there's so many shoulders that I'm standing on, and I'm like, this isn't an individual thing, but we're all symbiotic creatures, you know? Nothing is just us. And so I really appreciate everybody who's helped me and all of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.